Uh, welcome to the online marketing show. Um, my name is Chris Johnson and uh, I work for uh, AFU, who are knowledge partners for uh, the online marketing show this year. Um, and over the course of the next two days, we're bringing you three sessions um, related to the affiliate performance marketing uh, channel. Um, the session this morning is covering behavioural retargeting within affiliate marketing. Um, which will discuss the role that behavioural retargeting plays, uh, how it's emerged within the affiliate channel, uh, how it's currently being deployed, and uh, also the key areas of discussion and where we think it's going to be going. Um, so just to get an idea of uh, the audience, um, I'd just like to ask you, how many of you put your hands up if you work in and around affiliate marketing? Cool, okay. Uh, how many advertisers do we have here today? Many uh, affiliates and publishers. Cool. And um, how many of you have um, used retargeting at all? Not many. Cool. Okay, sure. Um, well, I'm glad to say we've been joined by a good panel of uh, experts today um, from all sort of areas of affiliate and uh, performance marketing. Um, so we'll just do some brief introductions and um, we'll start with Helen, I think. Okay, cool. Uh, can everyone hear me? Oh, right, so uh, hi, I'm Helen Southgate. I manage the pay for search and affiliate channels at VSkyB in the new customer acquisition team, and I also am chair of the IAB Affiliate Marketing Council. I'm Fiona Robertson, I head up the performance marketing channel for Big Mac Media, um, and I look after both the display and the affiliate marketing functions. And um, we use free marketing to do um, a number of different campaigns, both on the affiliate and the display side. I'm Andrew Copeland, I'm Client Services Manager for WebGains, the affiliate network. Um, I look after a team of account managers whose job it is to advise advertisers on which publishers to deal with, and then obviously, obviously uh, some retargeting into accounts as well. Morning. My name is uh, Ryan Gibb. I uh, work for a personalised retargeting company called MyThings, and I'm responsible for the advertiser and publisher side of the business. Cool. Um, and so, I think we'll start with just a brief introduction into uh, behavioural retargeting for anyone that's not um, too sure about it. So I think probably Lauren's the best place to give a quick overview. Yeah, thank you. So I guess um, if, uh, if you don't know much yet about behavioural retargeting, um, there's two key things to, to understand. So you have traditional behavioural retargeting which has been around for, for years and years. Companies like uh, Revenue Science and, uh, and also Facebook now, where an advertiser can go and can buy uh, advertising which is matched to, to their audience uh, in the hope of uh, increasing conversions that way and to acquire new users. Um, then you have the uh, retargeting companies, that's at the bottom of the funnel, this is what uh, my thing does. Um, essentially, it's, it's kind of like a CRM tool. Um, so we don't drive new traffic to the site, but we sit uh, at the bottom of the funnel. So all the traffic that doesn't convert, which is about 98%, which leaves the site, uh, we use uh, in-house technology to retarget users through their learned balance to drive the user back to the site a second time around to, to convert. Cool. Okay. Um, at any point during uh, the session, if anyone's got a question, um, it'd be good to get audience involvement. Um, if you just pop your hand up and grab my attention, um, the next time uh, there's a break in the in discussion, um, we'll come around to you. Um, so I think the first question, um, which I seem to get uh, asked a lot uh, through affiliates for you, and also uh, I read on the forum and articles and stuff, is um, the point of retargeting, won't the customers in the end just come back anyway, regardless? Um, and does anyone have any thoughts on that? So perhaps I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the most common questions, why should I pay for my own traffic when users come back? Um, and, and the fact is some users will come back naturally. Uh, each advertiser has a natural uh, site return conversion, but many users don't and that's why um, we see the majority of the traffic not returning unless it's, it's given, um, it, uh, unless it's stimulated basically. Um, and furthermore, once we start running campaigns, we were able to, to run any tests and to compare the natural performance of users that would come back naturally versus the users that do see banners that are encouraged to come back and to transact. So, um, so, so um, 
retargeting definitely has a very big impact. And um, furthermore, you have companies like Comscore who've, who've run trials and who have shown that uh, by showing banners to a user, even if the user does not click or interact with the banner, um, you still have much higher um, actions um, resulting from that, such as uh, increased brand searches, for example, and larger number of users that come back to the site. Key thing is about proving incremental sales. So you need to ensure that you have a benchmark. So if you run behavioral type retargeting, you need to kind of understand what you did before and what you did after and prove that incremental sales value. Um, I think that's obviously really important. I think where it becomes really, really interesting is where you look at how you drive that customer to click again. So whether you use a different offer, whether you use some cashback, whether you use a voucher, that's where I think it becomes really interesting because I think you're kind of, the person has gone to your site, left for whatever reason, and you're using something to try and entice them back. I think that's something that we should investigate a bit more through behavioral targeting. I think that's a really key point, and I think also, you know, if you compare it to the high street, if you, you know, if you've forgotten to go back for a particular item, and um, you may never ever go back for it, but you may also go back for it, um, and it's the same online. That kind of reinforcement of that message and trying to engage with someone um, means that they are they kind of tend to come back more. And we've seen that a much kind of increased um, improvement also in conversion rate, but also in click through rates as well. So it does definitely kind of have an impact. It's just like Kelly said, we need to make sure it's incremental and it's done in the right way. Okay, um, and I think uh, apart from uh, as we've got a lot of uh, affiliate uh, related people here today, um, in terms of uh, advice for advertisers um, from a networking agency perspective, you must get a lot of inquiries about advertisers that are looking to uh, implement behavior retargeting. So, what advice do you give out, and you know, what ways um, do you tell them whether you think it's going to work for them or not? I think there's, there's a lot of factors that you need to look at and, and you know another question we get asked a lot is well if we try it, you know, how many sales can we expect to see from it? And it's dependent on so many things and um, how you go about doing it, the rules that you set and the parameters you set within that. So I'm sure everyone's experienced retargeting at some point where people essentially feel like they're being stopped across the internet and you know a Christmas present's been ruined for someone because they see these ads continually. So there needs to be rules set um, in place so that um, you're, you're engaging at the, at the right moment in time, but also for the right length of time. Um, and the level of effectiveness is going to very much be determined by that. Um, don't want to put someone off if you want to try and encourage them to come back. So it's very important to set those kind of rules. Um, but just to kind of go back to the point about kind of volumes, you know, if you've got a, a very, very small site that doesn't see a huge amount of traffic, um, you know, these guys can't retarget someone that, um, that hasn't been to your site, so you need to have a decent volume of traffic going through to your site for them for someone to actually be retargeted for their message. So there's a lot of things that you need to take into consideration. It's not that you know, one size fits all, it's going to work for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like um, Google search engine marketing. You can't just turn it on and it, and it just works like that. Um, we work closely with advertisers to qualify uh, their site and business model. Uh, to make sure that it will drive value because most times retargeting is not for advertisers. Um, and we work very closely with advertisers to define the campaign goals, um, to set expectations, and, and then also to, to look a week, two weeks, three weeks, two months down the line to make sure we're meeting those, uh, those goals. Um, but yes, it's, you know, it's, it makes it very difficult for small advertisers to, uh, to use personalised retargeting because essentially we're, we're not driving new traffic, we're just driving back the traffic that's, that's been to the site. From a network perspective, it's also important that when we are talking to a potential advertiser about using retargeting in order to shape the form they, they may decide to employ it, that the metrics that they'll be analyzing at the end of the campaign or during after a test period are very clearly explained to them at the beginning. Unlike other affiliates who are really involved in driving new traffic, new customers to, to an advertiser's site and therefore adding you know, to their clicks and to their sales figures in terms of new business. Um, retargeting is a very different um, type of activity. Well, as Lauren said, it's not about adding new business, it's about converting the business that you've already got and then lost. Um, and it's natural, you know, we've had loads of times where, where an advertiser who doesn't necessarily kind of grasp the concept at the beginning tries to equate uh, a retargeting affiliate's performance to their other big affiliates on their programs. 
and goes, well, hang on a second, I, I can't make the, uh, the comparison, it doesn't work as well. But it's very important to understand that it's a very different benchmark. Um, and setting those rules, as Fiona said in the beginning, to be able to lay down exactly what you want to achieve. And most of the time that's done in conjunction with, with my things or whichever um, retargeting company you choose to work with. That's done up front. So it's very, very important that that gets done um, to, a, to a very finite degree of detail to make sure that once it's running, you can make sure that you're getting the money's worth. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, just like just like with other marketing channels, it's important not to look at retargeting in isolation. Um, you want to measure the performance of retargeting across the other activities, such as search engine marketing, affiliate marketing, perhaps other display. Um, we firmly believe that CPA is, is in the best interest of the advertiser, but many of the sophisticated large advertisers will buy CPM, CPC, will buy all sorts of different flavors, and will then have their own internal systems to to make sure that the channels are driving the right performance. And I think that's why it's, it's so important to, to have a holistic view of, of all the different channels, including retargeting, and to measure it in terms of driving incremental, not just driving traffic. I think, I think from, from your perspective, yeah. I think as, a, as, a, as you were first guy, um, encompass a lot of different channels. I mean, what considerations do you make um, you know, in regards to how that affects and influences um, the advertising aspect? I think um, the key questions that I ask as an advertiser are um, first about visibility. So I want to understand where my ads are being displayed, what exchanges they're on, because I need to understand how that affects my other online marketing, especially display. So there'd be no point, um, you know, I've got kind of my display channel doing marketing for some ad exchanges and I've also got behavior retargeting because then I'm just competing against myself. Um, so I think that's really, really key to understand what, where that advertising is and how it's being displayed as well. So this model generally is based on post impressions. So I want to make sure that my banner is where people can see it. I think that's really, really important. I then think um, how you pay commission on this. So um, my things work on a CPA. I think that's a really, really attractive um, kind of model to work on from an advertiser's perspective. But it's based on a post impression CPA. So. My question marks would always be around what's the percentage of post impression sales versus post click. So for something like this, I would tend to expect that post click should be a higher percentage than perhaps um, what I've seen kind of traditional non-behavioral advertising. So I think that's really important. Then going back to um, kind of how it affects other channels and really understanding the attribution model. So. Um, who is in that path to sale before the behavior retargeting? You know, is it display channel? Is it search? Is it affiliate? If it's affiliate, that can be a concern because they're losing commissions over it. So you kind of need to understand the effect of the cannibalization as well. So I think they're probably the three key concerns an advertiser would have and three questions I would ask. And I think it's still question marks over behavior retargeting, to be honest. Cool. Um, just at this point, um and we sort of just touched on post impression uh, and last book um, cookies. Um, you just pop your hands up if um, you uh, get the idea of post impression and, and last cookies. Quite a few. You might need a bit of explanation. I think Andy's probably yeah, yeah. the best place. Um, well, essentially, if you look at the affiliate market as a contained entity, you've got a model where most of the time, or in the UK, all of the time, uh, a last click will be attributed to the commission. So if a customer visits four or five different affiliate sites before deciding to complete an action, whether it be a purchase or something else, the last referring affiliate will get the commission. And that's industry-wide in the UK. Uh, in the European markets, impression has always been slightly more um, accepted than has in the, in the, in the UK. Um, and essentially what impression means is instead of the customer physically completing an action like clicking on an ad to begin the tracking process, all that really has to do is view an ad. So an ad just has to be displayed to them. Um, now, historically, the, the potential pitfalls of that is that, as I was saying, as an advertiser, you don't necessarily know where your ad is on a page. So if you visit favorite website, there's a banner ad across the top, there's a very, very good chance that you have seen that ad, or you at least acknowledge its presence uh, in front of you. That same ad can also be put right down the bottom of the page, right on the footer, 
And if you don't scroll down, you'll never see it. But the impression is still counted. The impression is still dropped because the ad is loaded. The fact that you haven't read all the contents and scrolled all the way down to the bottom of the page is immaterial. So in terms of how cookies or cookies work and how customers or affiliates are of remunerated for their actions, in general affiliate marketing, it's based on clicking. So somebody physically has to see an ad, click on it, and then go and complete a site or an action. So it's fairly clear cut as to the influence that particular affiliates have on the customer. With impression sales, it's a little bit different because you don't necessarily know that the customer has physically viewed your ad, and that it hasn't been an action. Now, with the IOB, I mean, Helen's probably the best person to answer once the IOB starts on this. Um, but there is a, a very clear cut cookie hierarchy within the industry in the UK, which lessens the, the impact of any impression sales um, and makes it a lot more palatable for, for advertisers, particularly to pay for their time impression. But I think you'd be the best place to explain how we got to that decision. Yeah, so um, the idea of the cookie, cookie hierarchy is that um, a post click impression will always overwrite post impression. Um, I think that's kind of standard, that's what happens in the industry. So the idea is that you know, whoever made the interaction on that last click will be awarded that sale, which I think is right, and that's um, kind of what we should do, and that's what we've been doing in the affiliate marketing in the online industry for a long time, I think. Um, my slight concern about behavior retargeting the affiliate industry is that they work on a post impression. Now, affiliate marketing in general doesn't use post impression. It has done years and years ago in the past, and I think it got quite a bad rep for doing that because it was abused, basically. So it's something that if you introduce, you have to control very, very carefully. Um, but as we're starting to kind of introduce behavior retargeting companies within the affiliate marketing sphere, I think we have to ask the question of why don't we offer post impression to other affiliates? I don't really think it's fair to say that one affiliate can work on post impression because they're behavior retargeting and another affiliate can't. I think we need to kind of start to look at affiliate marketing differently and understand the kind of true value that affiliates add outside of that last click. So display. We all measure um, display marketing on post impression and post click. I don't really see that a lot of kind of big affiliate publishers are any different to that. So I think it's great that we're kind of looking at it for behavioural retargeting, but I think we need to look at it for some of the really big affiliate publishers in the industry as well. Um, but the cookie hierarchy will always stay the same, that a click will always override impression and it should do. I think one of my um, slight concerns it is around how post impression is deduped. So if you're running behavioural remarketing through the affiliate channel, are you deduping that against your post impression display? That is actually a really, really complex process and we're looking at it at the moment, we haven't figured out how to do it. So I think that's really important as well. You don't want to be double counting your behavioural retargeting against your display because you're going to think you're getting a lot more sales than you are. So I think that's another important thing to remember about the hierarchy as well, that you need to DG the post click, you need to DG post impression against post impression as well. Yeah, so uh, I totally agree, and um, so obviously we work with the IAB, we use um, all the uh, UK rules necessary, um, and we, we work with the model that's best for, for the merchant. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if the post view window is seven days, 24 hours, or six hours, um, there needs to be value. Uh, once all the sales are deduped, and uh, if there is, it's working. If not, then either you know, best size retargeting and that advertiser are not made to be together, um, or the model needs to be revised. Um, CPA personalized retargeting is, is very much a partnership approach. It's not like driving clicks and, and, and that's it. Uh, there's a lot of adjustment at the start of the campaign to make sure that uh, the business model works, that the first and, and everything's in place. Uh, it's also fairly complicated. We have to, uh, we're plugged into all the affiliate uh, platforms because we need to retrieve in real time the deduped sales and make sure we don't think we're getting twice as many sales as actually we're being attributed. Because, because what we're doing with, with that data is we're deciding how to buy, where to buy the media and so on. For us, it's very important to work with the merchant, make sure we have the right commercial rules in place, um, which may mean that it's an intuitive process, um, and that we work very closely with the affiliate platforms to make sure that we always have the most accurate data possible, which allows us to, to 
find the users and buy that brooch. Like when I mentioned rules earlier as well as having rules for your campaign and how that's affecting the consumer and the user, like you said, it is really important to also have that applied to your, either your display campaign or your affiliate campaign because there's so much else that's going to be affected by it. Display you can kind of manage, it's, it's much, much easier from an agency perspective for us to manage it as part of the display campaign than it is um, from, from an affiliate marketing perspective because Ellen said it's always traditionally been last click and um, <coughs> um, retargeting and um, publishers were kind of introduced to the affiliate marketing industry. A lot of people had a lot of issues with it, particularly on the affiliate site because you know they've, they've never had the opportunity to be, to be paid for that in the past, so why all of a sudden is this group kind of coming into the mix? So I think that um, it needs to be something that's quite transparent to, to your affiliate base that this is something that you're, you're working on and it is designed to help the channel um, as opposed to kind of have a negative impact on it. So like rules across the board for new affiliates but as well as you internally is, is really, really important. From an affiliate point of view, um, it is also with as, as Ben said, it is worth communicating with any other affiliates that you deal with to let them know that you are going to be employing the over retargeting if you're an advertiser. Uh, if you do that through the affiliate channel, um, there is potential benefits for, for your other affiliates on the program. Um, because the nature of behavior retargeting means that you know, the behavior retargeting company are retargeting all customers, well, those, those that will convert, but they, the software works across your entire traffic base not only the traffic referred by your affiliates. So if your affiliate program accounts for 10 or 20% of the traffic, that means you've got 80% of the traffic coming from somewhere else, whether it be natural search, page search, display, whatever. Um, and the behavioral company will work across 100% of your traffic base. So what that means for the other affiliates on your program, mainly as a result of the UK rules around cookies and impressions, and that a click cookie will always count more than an impression and therefore earn a commission, is that if you've got an affiliate on a program who sends a customer through via a click, and that customer then leaves and decides not to purchase and are then be targeted later, the original referring affiliate gets the commission if it's only an impression that that customer was, was experienced, and experienced through the retargeting company, because the click counts more. So what we've seen as a network is that on campaigns or on programs where the advertiser has employed the have a retargeting through the affiliate channel, the other affiliates on the program have actually benefited from an increased conversion rate because of the fact that these guys go away and retarget those customers that left and the affiliate doesn't have to do anything. But because they've got a click cookie which weighs more, the commission goes to them even though the retargeting kind of double work to get the customer back. I guess um, from an advertiser's perspective, that's where the challenge comes in, attribution model. So effectively in that case, I'm paying my affiliate the commission for making that sale, but I'm also paying behavioural retargeting can we make that sell. So my whole cost per acquisition suddenly increases. I think that's something we really need to look into and really, really understand. So if the behavioural retargeting has assisted that affiliate sale, should the affiliate get paid the full amount? Should the behavioural retargeting company get paid the full amount? It's kind of understanding um, kind of how that CPA is made up. And I think that's where we need to really get to in online marketing, not just affiliate marketing. I think we're still a bit away from that as well. But it's, from an advertising perspective, it's um, a bit of a concern if you kind of double pay, and you actually don't want to be double pay, you need to kind of keep your CPA as it is. If you, if you do employ retargeting through the affiliate channel, though, at least with the affiliate channel, it's did you source, so yeah. you're going to pay once. The, the potential issue is if you employ behavior retargeting as a standalone entity, or as part of a display budget where you pay a CPM or a CPC that doesn't go through a deduping network or a tracking solution, if you like, um, where, you know, obviously a network such as, you know, we're going to any other affiliate network in the UK, that's what we do. We essentially reward the last preferred affiliate. So we can guarantee to our advertisers that on a particular transaction that goes through the affiliate program, they're only going to pay once for that. But like that says, it becomes very, very complex if that, that particular advertiser has five, six, seven, eight different types of online advertising with different agencies, with different tracking systems, and each agency uses a different way. Our systems aren't really designed to talk to each other. And that gives the advertiser a fairly complex job in trying to determine who exactly should get the, get, get the money at the end of that. Okay, I think um, uh, we talked about quite a bit uh, already. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to see if anyone's got any questions um, about anything that we've talked about already. Um, 
anyways. Um, anyone got any questions at all? Pop your hand up. There's one uh, at the back there. much. Um, I was just going to ask with regards to sort of incoming legislation regarding cookies, just to expand on that a bit more, and um, how, you, how, you sort of, how you sort of foresee that affecting you know, your behavioural tracking and you know, the data that you gather from it, um, what remedies you might propose or how you get around that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, happy to take that, that is actually the bane of my life at the moment, so <laughs> we're doing a lot of work on the e-privacy directive at the Ivory Affiliate Marketing Council. Um, but the behavioural retargeting industry is really interesting. So they, uh, a lot of this e-privacy directive um, was really focused on this industry. People in Europe got very concerned that all this data was being collected about people and being used to target them with marketing activity. So this kind of directive has really come about because of this. So what the behavioural retargeting industry has done with the IAB, they've um, done a European, kind of cross-European um, framework, it's a self-regulatory framework, where they're beta testing, um, on each behavioural retargeting ad you have an eye icon, and if you click on the eye icon you go to a site called Your Online Choices, and it explains what behavioural retargeting is, why cookies are being used, what cookies um, are being used, how they're being used across all the different ad networks, and um, what data they're collecting about you, and what the customer can then do, if they want to, is opt out from behaviour retargeting cookies. So this is going some way to comply with the directive which is saying that consumers need to consent for you to use cookies. Um, it's been accepted by the ICO, it's been accepted by the government, it's been tested across Europe at the moment. I, I still think it goes a long, well, it goes a short way to kind of answering the question of informed consent because it'll be interesting to see how many people actually click on that very tiny eye icon which is going to be on a behaviour retargeting ad and then how many people opt out because when you get to the opt out stage as well that you opt out of all the different um, behaviour retargeting companies and it's a list of maybe a uh, dozen, I think, and to be honest with you, I don't know who half of those are, and I work in online marketing, so your average customer isn't going to know who those are. Um, you can't opt out of brand-specific um, retargeting either, so somebody couldn't opt out of Sky, um, so I think that needs to be thought about a bit more, but I think they're making um, the first step in the online industry to answer this question around privacy um, and around cookies and how they're used, and I think uh, it will set a precedent for how the rest of the online marketing industry reacts to it. Um, if this is taken, this kind of level of informed consent is taken to be acceptable, then I think a lot of the other industry will go down that route, so we won't see pop-ups all over the place which everyone's really worried about. Um, but I think the focus really is on the behavioural targeting industry. That's what Europe's worried about, that's now what the UK are worried about. Um, so I think they'll have to prove somehow that they are, you know, educating customers about why they're using cookies and gaining informed consent to do that. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, I think, over the next six to 12 months. I think it's a really interesting point about the state that you mentioned because it is confusing to people who are even in the industry and it does, um, you know, if you're talking a lot about cookies and um, the way that people are tracked and that sort of thing, if, if you don't understand that, then I wouldn't have a clue. Plus the fact that the I is minuscule in the, the bottom right hand corner. Um, but they, they, they did something similar in the States um, about six to twelve months ago um, and kind of an opt out rate is something like 0.01%. So it's absolutely tiny. Um, so if it is something that is going to be accepted by the UK, which I think there's going to have to be some more changes around it because I don't think it is particularly consumer friendly. But if it does, I think the, the kind of feedback we've had from the States so far is that the impact is, is fairly minimal. Well, um, was quite interesting though. So the ICO website, they are kind of regulating this and they're implementing this across the UK. So what they did, um, I think it was 26th of May when this went live, they put a banner on top of their website which said, um, we want to use cookies, blah, 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 this is what cookies are, this is why we use them. You have to click here to consent to use those cookies. And a report came out a couple of weeks ago um, and it showed that 
think their traffic dropped, well, their web analytics traffic dropped, so obviously you could keep track, their web analytics dropped by 90%. So that was a big shocker, I think, to the entire industry. So, whoa, hang on, actually, people are maybe not going to opt in to use cookies. So they very much used an opt-in system, so you had to opt in to have your cookies dropped, but yeah, only 10% did opt in, so I think that's a big concern. The behaviour retargeting is slightly different, it's more of an opt-out and it's an informed consent, but I think that definitely shows we really, really don't want to go down that route of people opting into cookies, because that would be pretty disastrous for the whole online industry. Yeah, so... Um... So the cookies not, not only cover behavioural targeting, uh, behavioural retargeting, we also cover uh, traditional behavioural targeting display, Google Analytics really covers um, a lot of different sort of cookie uses. Um, so the implications are quite, uh, quite big if you, if you have to opt out, uh, if the user has to opt in, sorry, for 20, 30 cookies before the user so. Um, we've been part of the IAB uh, BT Council for uh, well over a year now, and uh, we've offered opt out um, since we started our business. Uh, so we really try and educate users. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to get them to convert to sale, not to learn. Um, and so we're trying to be as transparent as possible. Uh, if they're not happy with the advertising they're seeing, we're explaining it to them, explaining why they're seeing the, the ad and allowing them to completely opt out from the advertising in, in one click. Uh, and so furthermore, we're, uh, we're working with the IAB to, uh, to enable uh, users to sign out of our retargeting through the URL traces uh, website also, so without having to go to our site. Um, is there any more questions? Uh, one at the front? Um, that's the best, best way for the mic to back in. I work for a travel company. We're um, thinking about behavioural retargeting for the first time. And um, I'm just wondering how reliant it is on a, on a good product feed uh, to display um, an ad which will then convert. Um, um, Obviously, recognizing the customer's original search, so they searched for a trip in Vietnam, does it display that? Or is it enough to then, or is it enough to present a more generic brand out of your product feed? Is it quite up to speed? That's a great question. And I haven't paid this gentleman to ask it. Um, so, my things doesn't actually use feeds. We, uh, we have custom tags on an advertiser site which picks out all the information. Um, I think feeds are useful where you have very very dynamic data, and perhaps you're trying to, to show something different in the balance. Um, but usually there's enough on the site in terms of the images, the descriptions, the prices, and everything else uh, to be able to work with an advertising without a feed. I think it also depends on what you want to achieve. So if it's just a case of kind of showing someone, you know, three different hotels that they've looked at and continually rotate that to them, then something like a product feed is going to be a more useful way to try and display that kind of information from what can escape from the site as well. But um, Helen kind of mentioned earlier on things like promotion, because that type of thing can work really, really well as well. So that doesn't necessarily apply to product feed. You just need to know kind of if it's a particular route or a particular area that someone's looked at and then serve them something that's kind of specific to that particular area. So there is still an element of kind of dynamic, um, dynamically changing cases that you would need within that, but like um, once said, you don't necessarily need a product feed to be able to do that. Normalise on tags that you've got on the site and all that. Yeah, also, so you can, you can achieve that without a feed, so we have uh, campaign management, so if you want to segment the campaign, for example, I promote holidays to Libya, Egypt, um, perhaps they're not doing too well right now, and uh, you're trying to get rid of your stock, you can uh, segment certain parts of your site and, and do a big sale and instantly push that message into the back, so if you want to go there. Okay. I think, um it's behavior retargeting is really interesting. I can see why it could be completely effective, but I really think the opportunity is in an offer and enticing people in more. So at Sky, when we do um, display activity post-click and the sales are quite low, when we do activity where we're offering a 
very big incentive like a voucher, our post-click sales go up significantly. And I think that shows that people will click and react to an offer. Um, and that, this, that's why I think behavioural retargeting would be really interesting. So they've come in, they're not interested, but you could kind of get them in with something else. And if you can maybe target that to what they were looking at, then I think you know, you're onto a real big winner there. Yeah, so, so one last thing, so, so you can look at things in a really basic way and just retarget users and try, them to, try to get them to come back and, and convert. Uh, or you can, you can segment based on your stock, based on you know, what your campaign objectives are, and, and still that's, that's really transaction based. But what we see our, our most uh, sophisticated advertisers do is they're, they're not just looking at generating a transaction, they're looking at, you know, is this an existing um, user, or are we acquiring a new user? Because you know, clearly if it's an existing user, you want to drive an incremental sale, you're going you're gonna to look at the ROI very differently to, oh, this is a brand new user who's, who's not signed up, who's never bought something. But if I get them to, to buy today, in the next six months, in the next two years, I can get them to come back two, three, four, five times through email marketing, through other marketing channels. And all of a sudden, you know, the value of that user is, is, is interpreted in a completely different way to just generating a, a one-time transaction and looking at the ROI that way. Also, just going back to your question, um, with the overtitling as before, I'll say you can do it without being just straight from the site. But if you're looking at it in, in the context of your affiliate program, the other affiliates don't necessarily have that kind of technology. So, Question, yeah. For behavior retargeting copy, you can get away without doing it, without having a good fee. The other affiliates on the program, you will probably need some sort of fee for them anyway. Um, but, you know, with travel, it's, it's a little bit more challenging, so we say, than most, because the sheer volume of potential combinations is massive. So, generally speaking, you know, it's, it's either going to be an API or something along those lines. But, yeah, I would definitely recommend having something available for the other affiliates on the program, which, worst case scenario, can be used by the heavy retailers company or best case scenario they can scratch from the site. Um, I think one other thing that um, is slightly related to this in terms of uh, frequency capping and frequency time, um, that is um, for showing um, the same banner to the list of the same that will count uh, a number of times for a set amount of time. Um, there's a lot of talk about how that can could potentially damage a uh, publisher brand website, brands itself, the product. Um, how do you uh, gauge the, the, the frequency cap uh, and timing? Um, so for us it's pretty easy. Um, because we work on a CPA, we have to be very, very careful in terms of, in terms of how we drive a sale because we're, we're limited. Right? If we're selling, trying to get a user to convert on a, a hundred pound pair of jeans, if commission is 10%, we can return 10 pounds. Um, and that's it. So we need to we need to try and second guess the user in terms of whether that user is going to convert or not. Uh, make sure they're not spammed, and detag the user as soon as the user is converted, or if we think that that user is actually probably not going to convert. And that's the difference between a business model that's geared towards driving a sale versus personalized retargeting, which is more clicks based, more buying clicks. And um, there's, there's obviously you can have a conversion at the end, uh, probably, but essentially you're not getting a ton of clicks. And the way to generate the risk that's possible is to have this, this frequency capping. Um, so we enforce really strict frequency capping with all of our publishers. Uh, typically it's up to five a day. With some uh, publishers like Google and Exchange, we work in very uh, sophisticated ways with real time bidding. Uh, and that gives us even more control. Um, but one complaint we frequently get from advertisers, and one of the reasons they switch it, uh, is the lack of respect for the users who feel spammed, and also the brand damage. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's impressive to a user to see somebody's brand frequently, but it's it's spammy to a user to see the brand permanently on the so uh, there's a big difference in it. I think it depends on what and how you buy it because if, if 
key value on a CK basis, then you know a lot of the risk is kind of put back on to the affiliate essentially who's going to run in that campaign and the costs are mainly incurred by them in terms of a sales generated. Um, so a lot of that's going to put back on them, but the amount of control that an advertiser then has um, is, is more limited than you would have in a CPM campaign, for example, when you're the one or the agency's the one that kind of sets, sets the, the frequency caps, that sets the time on it or um, the, the length of time you're allowed to kind of keep serving that ad to somebody. So um, I would say that it depends on kind of the level of control that an advertiser needs or wants to have, whether buying on the CPM model um, is better you know, versus the, the CPM model. But, I mean, you kind of touched upon relationships earlier on and affiliate marketing is all about partnerships and, and having that relationship with people and this is no different. So if you have a, a retargeting affiliate that you're working with, you should know exactly what parameters are set in place so that they aren't damaging your brand and they aren't spamming users and still coming across the internet, like I said earlier on. So um, I think regardless of what way you buy, um, those elements of the rules are really, really important to be safe early on so that um, everyone knows where they place that into it. Uh, we've got any more questions? Um, okay. Um, and I guess, sort of moving forward then over um, the next few months, um, in the light of the e privacy directive, um, do you think that, and that's being done to educate um, the users of what they're seeing, um, and have you noticed an, an uptake of, uh, of consumers um, asking about what, why they're seeing these? Um, these retargeting banners, and this is something that um, worries you at all? I think that um, users find banners useful, uh, generally. Uh, if they understand why they see the banner, uh, they would prefer to see a more personalised version of the internet than just random stuff. Um, the problem is when it gets too intrusive, and it needs to be a lot better understanding as to how to, how to manage that personalised experience. Um, and I think we're still in the, in the first generation of not even personalised retargeting, but dynamic times. You know, Google, um, you know, Google bought TerraSend, uh, Yahoo bought Apple, uh, there's lots of companies doing personalised retargeting. I think that in the near future, just about every single banner that's set on the internet will have some customised, some personalised element on it. And right now, we're still very much at the early stages of creating a fully uh, customised experience for users. Um, from my perspective, so working quite close with the IAB, I, I don't think there's been enough done in general in the online industry to educate consumers on what cookies are and how they're being used. I think. There's a big danger of this kind of being splashed out in the media, as it has been a little bit already. Um, Daily Mail type stuff, which scaremongers people about what cookies are and how they're being used. Now, we need to educate consumers that cookies are good. They make your life exploring the internet um, a lot more pleasurable, a lot easy. Everything's um, a bit more personalised. You know, you can save passwords, you can save baskets, you can recommend things. Um, I don't think there's anywhere near enough being done. I think we could be in danger of that kind of spiralling out of control if we don't do it. I know that the IAB are working on um, some kind of communications and some education pieces to do this along with the behavioural retargeting industry, but I think it's a big concern if we don't go out there first and stop the scaremongering. And I think it's a lot of work to be done in that area. Because this directive isn't going to go away, so as much as everybody wants to bury their heads in the sand, it's here, it's law. And um, yet the ICO have given everybody 12 months from 26th of May, but it, it will be enforced, so we have to do something about it. And I think we need to really educate customers on why cookies are great for the internet. Yeah, definitely. I mean, from a, um, from a middleman, which is what it meant, because essentially, point of view, I had a client bring me up the other day who they've heard about the, 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 the privacy directive and they kind of understood what it meant. But it only really dawned on them about a week ago that what happens in May next year when the, the year's implementation period is up and they've got to turn off all their analytics, they've got to turn off their affiliate programs, no track anymore, no, no display tracks anymore, unless something is done between now and then. I mean, from an advertiser point of view, the only cookies that are really allowed under the directive are those that are classed as strictly necessary for business, i.e. I've clicked this, I've put it in my basket, 
I can't buy it later on unless it's, it's still there. That cookie is therefore strictly necessary, potentially. Um, but your analytics is not strictly necessary, your affiliate cookies are not necessary, your display cookies, nothing of that. What would happen tomorrow if we all turned it off? Yeah. There'd be no reason to have a panel like this, there'd be pretty much be no internet. So, yeah, there's definitely more that needs to be done. Um, and to make matters a little bit more complicated, the implementation of that directive um, is kind of up for interpretation depending on what country in Europe you're in. So if you have any international reach, it makes it even more interesting because each European country, while they have to put it into law, don't necessarily have to do it verbatim. They can interpret the law to a degree the way that they want to. So, you know, what happens in the UK, it's different to what happens in France. And what is interesting is, um, there was a poll last week, I think, that the Netherlands it's quite unusual considering what's the country that is. They've implemented the law as it is. So they've implemented it that you have to get consent before you drop a cookie. So the entire online industry in the Netherlands is just absolutely panicking. The UK haven't done that. Thank God they've gone for the informed consent approach. But um, that raises a lot of questions about kind of global advertisers and how they work in the Netherlands compared to the UK. That kind of affects affiliates. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion and a lot of debate going on over the next few months about this. Well, I think we need to leave that if we run over our time. Um, I'd like to thank the panellists uh, for joining us um, today. Um, they're going to be hanging around uh, for a little bit here and also at the APU stand just outside. So if you've got any questions you want to ask them, then uh, please come on over after. All right, thanks very much. Cheers.